meetings that we have the opportunity to have. I believe that in the normal round of things, while we're coming to church and we're carrying on with our businesses as usual, that we are having the last moments of earth's history to do the work that God has asked us to do. And I believe that very soon that there are going to be many that wake up with a desire to do something for the master, but it's going to be too late. Uh, I read in the Bible where the Bible speaks of the Protestant church under the figure of Sardis in the seven churches. And in fact, let's turn there, Revelation chapter 3. Continue to bless these words, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, I want you to notice what the Bible says there in Revelation, the third chapter. This is the church addressed to the Sardis church. This is the church of the Protestants. And you remember that when that church came out of Rome, when Martin Luther and those reformers came out of Rome, they were not a dead church. They were a living church. Is that right? Amen. They came out of Rome. They were through with the idolatries and the abominations. Luther himself, he, he wrote on the walls of Wittenberg, 95 theses. And that was just, that wasn't 95 things wrong with the church. I used to believe that was 95 things wrong with the church. That was simply 95 things wrong with indulgences. He would have had another hundred more to say about other practices in the church. And when he went there, you know, it came to a point where they, they said to Luther, that reformer, you know, reformers are never liked in their day. You know that. And they're like years later, but never in their time are reformers like. And Martin Luther, they said one time, do you retract? Uh, we give you an opportunity to retract your words. And Martin Luther says, yes, yes, I do retract. I recant. And they, they were, they were, Martin Luther recant? He said, yes, I do. He said, before I said that, 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 that the vicar of Christ, the Pope, was next to the devil, now I know he's the devil himself. <laughs> I said, that's a reform. <laughs> it's amazing that reformers today don't say that. They, they get in bed and give gold medals to him. That's right. but, but that reformer, he was much different. This is the way the reformers were. They were a living church, vibrant. They were full of life. But something happened in 1844. Mm -hmm. and in Revelation 3, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 3. The Bible says, beginning in verse 1, it says, and unto the angel of the church of Sardis, this is that reformed church. These things said he that have the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou has a name, that thou livest, and are, what does it say everybody? Yeah. Isn't it amazing to have a living name but to have a dead experience? You know, Seventh-day Adventists, we have a living name, my friends. The very name Seventh-day Adventists didn't come from man. That name was chosen out of the authority of heaven. God himself gave us that name. Amen. We have a living name that is to be born to the close of probation. And yet the Bible says that, that there will come a church that will have a name that they're living, but their experience would be dead. That was the Reformed Church back uh, when they rejected the first angel's message. My friends, I wonder if seven Adventists have a name today that we're alive and yet we're dead. You know God can't use a dead church. You know that, don't you? The only type of church that God can use is a living church. And if I go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, before we get ready to stop and pray, and get into the message this afternoon, we're going to be studying into the subject, a living church. I believe that more importantly, we must understand what our church should be, what God wants us to be, because the world's in trouble. Do you believe the world's in trouble? Thank you. Can God of himself help the world without the church? God uses the church as his appointed agency for the salvation of man, and eventually, through the church, will be revealed the full and final display of the love of God. And my brothers and my sisters, this is why that Satan has done everything he can to make sure the church is not alive, but the church is dead. You know what? I want, to, I want you to read something very interesting before we read that. Do we have our screen on? I want to read something very interesting uh, from the screen in just a moment, talking about the living church. You're going to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I want you to notice what the Bible says because you know, I want to ask you a question. What's stronger? What's stronger? A lion or a dog? What's stronger? 
Lion is stronger. Is that right? Is that what you said? No, no. The lion is not strong. Well, I say it this way. It depends on the condition of that lion and that dog. Is that right? <laughs> we'll see that in just a moment before I read the Bible. I want you to see something. We noticed earlier that it says how the angels must feel seeing the end approaching and those who claim. <coughs> Can you see that? Yes. You can't see it? Now, could, you, could you push it back for me a little bit? Thank you. And it says, and those who claim to have a knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, huddle together and do what? Colonize. And colonize. And attend the meetings. They do what? Attend the, attend the meetings. And feel dissatisfied if there's not much what? Preaching. Preaching. Well, if, the, if the minister doesn't preach just the way we want, how we want, you know, I don't, I don't believe that happens here, but in some churches, you get to 1230 and everybody's leaving. It's like some magic buttons under the desk. As soon as 1230 comes, somebody pushing, and people just pop up like a popcorn. I don't know where that came from, but this says, and attend the meetings and feel dissatisfied if there's not much preaching to do what? Benefit. Benefit their souls and strengthen the church <coughs> while they are doing literally nothing. nothing. Then she says, watch it now. Christian service 179. Let's read it. It says, nothing will so do what? Around. Around. What is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs? A revival. A revival. A We've heard that come down from the president of the general conference, have we not? His words is but an echo of a statement in selected messages that tells us that the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs is a revival. revival. Yeah. We're told in other places to be blended with the Reformation. Now, my friends, listen to me. If we are told from inspiration that the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs is a revival and Reformation, we don't have to wonder what we need. As a church, we don't have to wonder, I wonder what we need first. He says, to seek this should be our first, first work, not second, not third, first it's no question what I think of when I come to a church. The very first thing that must happen, there must be a revival and there must be a reformation. Well, my friends, if you're dead, what do you know you know what you need? Revival. The very fact that the greatest of the church needs is a revival suggests to us the condition of the church. Right. We wouldn't need a revival if we were alive. Is that right? So what God needs is a living church. Now listen. It says, nothing will so do what? Right. What does arouse me? To wake up. I'm going to tell you something. If you go to sleep in here, I'm going to arouse you. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amen. It says, so arouse a self-sacrificing zeal and broaden and strengthen the character as to engage in... Work. As to engage in what? Work. Work for who? Others. Others. Many professed Christians in seeking church relationship think only of them. Yeah. You know, when a person thinks about a church, they think, I wonder how the preacher is that, at that church. I, I, I think about going to Emmaus, but I wonder who's going to come and preach today. How many cars are going to be out there? How many other people are going to be there? Or wherever church we go to, most times we're thinking of the preaching. We're thinking of who attends. Are there going to be other young people there, other adults? And we think as a relationship to sociality. And who's going to preach? I wonder if that's what the church is for. I wonder if that's going to get us ready for the crisis. It says, in seeking church relationship, they think only of what? Themselves. They wish to enjoy church fellowship and pastoral care. They become members of what type of a church? Large. Of a large and prosperous, prosperous churches. And are content to do. Do you know this is the majority of the church today? <clears throat> are content to do little for others. In this way, they are robbing themselves of the most precious blessings. Many would be greatly benefited by sacrificing their what? Pleasant. Blessing. Blessing. This is Christian service 179. By sacrificing their pleasant, ease producing associations. They need to do what? Go. I'm going to stop there for a moment. They need to do what? Go. Go. I wonder where they need to go. Prophet said we need to wake up. I wonder where we need to go. Mike. This is a dead battery. This is the condition of our church. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. 
And just as a battery needs to be placed into, into this, this microphone, we need that same thing in our churches. This is a very, this is a very practical illustration. By God's grace, I hope that we make sure we got a living battery. Is that right? <laughs> we want to make sure we get living batteries. But this says that we need to do what? Go. Now, I wonder where we need to go. They need to go where their energies will be what? Called out in Christian work, and they can learn. learn. So if we're ever going to revive and reform and be ready for what's coming in tonight, I'm going to show you how close that is. I'm going to show you tonight by God's grace that we're living just a few short months to a few short years from the crisis, and everything is taking place. This is God's saying. Now, my brothers and my sisters, but we have but a short time to arouse and understand and learn to bear these responsibilities, I wonder if we can get this at a large, large church. Yeah. You know what that is right there? That's Elijah. You know what he's doing right there? He's not, he's not preaching the message right there. You know what he's doing? Right. He's running. You know where he ran to? He ran to a cave. Did God send him there? No. Now God sent him to Cherub. God sent him on his missions, but God did not send him to that cave. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Now, do you know the prophet compares that cave to the large churches? Mm -hmm. Struggling. He was ready to die in that cave. And many today are ready to die in large, prosperous churches because they are not working for the master. Mm -hmm. Look what the prophet said. I'm not making it up. December, uh, December 18, 1888. You know, you know that year, don't you? Was that an important year? It says, when Christ went away, he gave to every man his work. This rests upon every one of us. If God should speak to you, he would say as he did to who? Elijah, what doest thou here? God did not tell you to leave your small churches. Now, God didn't tell you who did. The devil. Like you, you act like you don't know. Let me tell you, the devil told you. God did not tell you to leave your small churches, to come and settle down in this large church where your gift is swallowed up. I ask, is there no missionary work for you to engage in? May the God of heaven stir up your minds and hearts. This is what I want to do today. I want to stir up your minds. Number one, if you're in a large church, to find the small church. And then number two, if you're in a small church, to understand what should our churches be doing right now so that we can be a living church. And it says, where you are given, it says, I stir up your minds and hearts. This work does not rest alone with the Minister. ministers. But every man is to search the scriptures for himself. That he may give a reason for the hope that is within him with meekness and fear. There is a field before you where? In the, in the home. Where else? In where else? In the and in the church. And it, is the very, and it is this very work that God wants you to do. Now watch. Next paragraph. Same review and arrow. December 18, 1888. It says, we each have a what? Duty. Every person in this room, old or young, have a duty. It says we each have a duty to perform. The light of heaven has revealed to us that everyone who would take upon himself this work would have the blessing of God, and thus the light of truth be reflected across the pathway of others. Now, would you read this part with me? Look what it says. What? Would you read what, what does it say? What? What doest thou here, my who sent you here that you might come into this large church to be a burden instead of a shining light as you should be? A living church is a working church. Is a what? Working church. I want you to repeat that with me. A living church is a working church. A living church is a working church. And I ask you a question. And what is a dead church? One is not working. Now notice, this has no reference to the numbers of how many members that church has. You see, in our minds, in the world today, the idea is, if a church has a thousand, two thousand, three thousand members, it's alive. If it has twenty thousand, it's alive. But the closer you crowd those people together, they're dead. Mm. Babylon don't know anything about that. Now, my brothers and my sisters, and we think that if a church only has two or three members, it has to be dead. 
Nobody's coming. Look at the parking lot. Not even two cars. But can you imagine that Jesus attends some of these churches while he won't step foot in some of the other churches? He said, we're two or three gathered together in my name. My brothers and my sisters, I don't know about you, but I cover the presence of Christ. And so God would have these big churches broken up. Instead of a mega church, we found the mega message. Is that right? Now, my brothers and my sisters, do you know that today that living churches have nothing to do with members? You can have a church that's dead with two members. You can still be a dead church with two members. That's right. Or you can be a dead church with 20,000 members. Some people look and they say, look at Eddie Long's church. <laughs> My friend, that's Babylon. I'm not moved by that church. Amen. They say, look at all the churches of all these Sunday ministers. And there are many that love God and these churches. But my friends, those churches are soon going to be emptied out into the remnant church. Amen. If we understand the message. Amen. While many of us are going to be shaken out. Amen. And so God is saying, we need a living church, not based on numbers, but based on an experience. A living church is a working church. church. And what is a dead church? Well, it's not working. Church that's not, not working. working. We need to know what that work is because we have a great work to accomplish and but a short time. And but a little time. Now, I asked a question when we first started, and that was what is stronger, a lion or a dog? And you told me a lion. And you believe the Bible, won't you? Go to the book of Ecclesiastes 9. Are you there, amen? And I told you it depends on the condition. Let's see what the condition is. Verse 4. Ecclesiastes 9. Beginning in verse 4, let's read that together. The Bible says, For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now, Babylon has been composed in the Bible to a lion. Is that right? Has, it, has Babylon been composed to a lion? You go to Daniel, you see that Babylon was denoted in prophecy as a lion. Mm -hmm. But it's dead. And while we look at that condition, I don't care how large Babylon is, it's nothing, no matter how small the remnant is, if the remnant is alive. Right. Right. But to have a dead dog, what is a dead dog going to do to a dead lion? My friends, what we need is not so much numbers, what we need is a living church. I want to be a living church, what do you say? Amen. And so we're going to study that this morning. What is this living church? How do we get it? How can we experience it? We know it has to do some of the work. We've noticed that the work included the three English messages. Did we see that? Yes. And so we want to pick up right there. But before we do, I want you to reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord. spend a few moments not thinking about everybody else, but thinking first of our hearts and home as youth and adults, as whole families, to say, Lord, if, if Jesus were to attend the church that I go to every week, would he ask me, what doest thou here? And would he send me to a small church in which my family and I can grow spiritually? Or would I think about the, the condition of the preacher or the condition of the church and want just simply sociality? Let's pray and talk to God about that. And after a few moments of silent prayer, I'll close and I'll out from a friend. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you're so merciful to us, that you condescend to meet us right where we are and seek to help us. Father, you see that the world is literally falling apart, and as a church, we're sleeping and doing literally nothing, while all of heaven is indignant 
Oh, Father, we pray that you will arouse us, that you will stir us, that you might help us to become a living church. And Lord, if this means that you must transplant us from the local church we are into a smaller church where we can work for the master, then I pray, Lord, that you would put that conviction in every heart. I pray, Lord, that you would help that this little Emmaus church would become a pattern based on the church of heaven because simply being a small church does not make us a place where God can send his people. Father, teach us the work of the church and show us what we are to be doing now that as we engage in this work that you will be restoring in us the image of Jesus. Now, and abide with us and remove every distraction. Father, please have mercy upon us to think that someone could come into a church and be texting someone else. Father, please have mercy upon us. May we recognize what it means to be not in a dead church, but in a living church with your presence. When the church was alive, people died for less than that, Father. Please bring that time back again where that living church will be in us and the fear, the respect, and the reverence that belongs to you would be in us. Calm the babies, Father, and give us an understanding of you like never before. Now, and abide with us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are my means. Timothy chapter 3, I want you to notice what the Bible says, and we're going to be still in the class. I'm going to ask you questions. You know what I want? Answers. I want answers. And the answer is going to be right there in the Bible. The answer is going to be right there, right in front of our faces. And we want to study and understand for ourselves. Because, my <coughs> friends, it's a fact that our world is in trouble. Isn't that a fact? <laughs> I don't believe that anybody with any reasoning ability in their mind that has any sense that whether religious or non-religious would believe that, but, but that we're in trouble. I care not whether that man was a Christian or a communist. I care not whether that man was an atheist or an Adventist. I care not whether that man, as I said, was a Democrat or Republican, religious or non-religious. Any man that can think and look around at the conditions of the world would know that our world is in trouble. I mean, you just look over at Libya. Is the world in trouble? You look over right now at the uh, at southern uh, Asia, northern Africa, and the Middle East, and we see country at the country. We know of Bahrain. We know of Tunisia. We know the uh, the protests and the riots and the bloodshed that has come out of Egypt and Cairo. And all of these things are indicative of the fact that the world is getting ready to explode in a condition much as we've never seen it before. We're told that all are going to tend to involve the world in a struggle similar to that which involves France, that the whole world is going to explode into something that has been called an inspiration as a, 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 as a demonstration of what took place in the French Revolution. Amen. My friends, we see the revolt of it today. Amen. We see the boiling today, and it's not just out there in other countries. Amen. Right here in America, Amen. we're in trouble. Amen. We can look at our churches and see we're in trouble. We can look at the marriages of our homes. I mean, think of it today. 
that the marital breakups that are taking place in the world are taking place right here in the Seventh Avenue churches. Amen. Mm -hmm. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. The same problems and the raising of children that is going on in the world is happening right in our homes. The same problems of uh, 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 pornography and abuse. You know that right now that many in the church are being destroyed by pornography. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. You think that a man or a woman could be ready to meet Jesus while being engaged in pornography? And our young kids, our adults, I never forget having a church where a young man came to me, a member of the church, young man in about the fifth grade, and said, Pastor, I'm struggling with pornography. He said it's so easy. I just get on the internet, and that 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 was that was in the, that was in, in, in the late nineties, two thousand, and in that time frame. And today, you know how easy it is. Ministers of this church, members of this church, playing around and thinking that nobody can see. It. You know, sometimes those little iPads and these little other things that we develop, while sometimes they can be used for good, sometimes the devil uses it, and we sneak around in somewhere. We have our little computers at the house. We are a little other thing that think that nobody else can see us, but God sees us. My brothers and my sisters, this is going on today. Not only among the men, but the women, not just pornography, but we see sins of every grade and character, and we're wondering what is taking place in our world. My brothers and my sisters, what we call life, the Bible calls signs of the last days. That's right. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Beginning in verses 1, let's read that together. 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, This know also, that in the last days that perilous time shall come. What does that word perilous mean? You know what it means. Dangerous. Dangerous. This is a clear description. You know the verse. I'm not going to read it. You know the verses. It perfectly describes the condition of the generation that we're living in today when we see the unnatural perfection where we can have sitcoms and movies today where homosexuality Preach is called an alternative lifestyle. See it. My friend, it's an abomination. Yes, it is. I don't call it an alternative. That's right. The Bible says that a man that participates in it and is abominable and praise God, he loves the sinner, but he hates that sin. Amen. Man. My friends, that these very things that we see that are taking place all over the world, it wasn't long ago, a couple months ago, I think I forget that actor's name, I think was it Jim Carrey, I forget his name, okay. came out with this famous movie now, and he was supposed to be some, some ex-con. <laughs> all of a sudden he stars in the movie, he goes to prison. And the whole storyline of that movie was that he now finds his lover in prison. That's a shame. It was a box office hit. I, I, I saw on the paper and I, I was reading something else and I, I caught a glimpse. It almost made me sick just reading about it. Yes, Lord. And people today are watching it and become so desensitized that we don't know what's taking place around us. We can look and say, oh, that's just Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> Our minds are so degenerated right. that she doesn't even cause us to raise an eyebrow anymore. That's right. That's right. My brother and sister, but we're told that this would take place just prior. Yes. This Sunday law taking place just as it was in Simon and Gomorrah. We see it today. The world is in trouble. And my friends, I want to ask you a question. Is the world going to get better? No. And yeah. your politicians say they're going to get better. <laughs> they say they're going to change the world. <laughs> they say that if you vote for them, they're going to fix their taxes and you voted for them. <laughs> but you didn't get any better taxes, did you? <laughs> they, they told you that, 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 that your 401k is going to get better, but it didn't get any bigger. They told you that your condition of life was going to get better. And if you didn't believe the political leaders, well, you believe the chairman of the Federal Reserve when he told you we were out of the economic crisis. Cool. Right. You ran back and say somebody's came. <coughs> I remember hearing somebody. They didn't say it to me, but they said, we're out of the crisis. What about the prophecy? I said, poor fools. <laughs> this night is it required. Do you understand? We didn't go anywhere. That's right. We're in a further crisis now than we were in then. Amen. And do you know what's getting ready to take place? Oh, let me hold on because if I do, I won't be able to finish today. <laughs> there is a crisis that is looming around us. And the only hope for us is to come to Jesus and to do the work that God has asked us to do. And so the devil says, prevent them from becoming interested and involved in the very work that's going to save their souls. That's right. That's, right. that's what he's done. Get them in some large church. Get them so entertained so that, that all they want to do is come to church and hear a drum beat. That's right. Hear a guitar playing. And as a result of listening to this, we think the church is alive. This is 
true. Somebody said, the reason why your church is dead is because you're singing dead hymn no song. The last time I checked, I don't care how much music you play, it won't bring a dead man back to life. That's right. You go down to the graveyard, you play that drum. Will they bring that man back up? You play the music, no music, but the name of Jesus can bring a man back to life. Amen. The words of Jesus, Jesus over the red grave of Lazarus said, I am the resurrection and the life with no choir, but the words of God. Amen. You know why? Because the words are life. That's why the devil don't like us to study the word. You see, the moment you start studying the word, I care not how dead you've been. I care not how uninterested you've been. The moment you fasten your mind on the word of God and say, Lord, take away my boredom and give me interest, and you pursue and persevere through it, God brings life as you start eating of his pages. Amen. Jesus said, whosoever eateth the flesh of the Son of Man and drinketh his blood, he have life. John 6, 53. So the devil says, keep them out of this word of God. My friends, I care not what the political leaders say. I care not what the religious leaders say. They say it's going to get better. They say, you don't have to worry about what's going on, but it's not getting better. What does the Bible say? Verse 13, let's look at it. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. The Bible says, but evil men and seducers shall wax better and better. Worse and worse. Shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. The Bible is clear in the last days that when the times become perilous and dangerous, it's not going to get better. The Bible says in the last days, it's going to get worse and worse until it explodes and to what the Bible calls the time of trouble. Daniel said there's going to be a time of trouble. Such as was never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. The Bible says that it's going to get worse and worse until the time of trouble. And you and I know that that time of trouble is going to start over the seal of God and the mark of the beast. That's going to bring us to the final conflict. Amen. We know that that first, that Sunday law is going to pass in America. We know that's going to start what an inspiration calls the little time of trouble. Yes, Lord. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse after that. Mm -hmm. It's going to increase and increase until the Bible calls it that we're going to see Jacob's time of trouble and then the falling of the plagues and it's not going to get better until the righteous see the face of sweet Jesus. Praise him, man. We were reading about it last night. Crazy. That little, that little cloud about half the size of a man's fist, we're going to see it in just a little while. It's reality, but my friends, if we're not a living church, if we are dead inside of a living church, when we see that cloud instead of happiness, it will create fear. Instead of running to Jesus and saying, Lo, this is our God, we'll be running to the rocks and mountains saying, Fall on us. And do you know that many in seven day Adventist churches are going to be running from Christ because instead of alive, they're dead. Right. My friends, only a living man or woman, mm. only a living member of the church body will be able to look up at the face of sweet Jesus. Yes, Lord. And this is why that what we do, we must do quickly, is not going to get better. That Sunday law is going to make them mark the time of it getting worse. Well, my brothers and my sisters, do you think that God wants to do something to this world, or do you think God hates the world? Does God love the world? Yes. The Bible says, for God so loved the world yeah. that he gave his only begotten son. That they do what? <laughs> then he said, I came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. saved. So God wants to save the world. Is that right? Amen. But my friends, how is God going to save the world? How is God going to impress the world and change the world and improve the world? If it's getting worse and worse, how is he going to do it? Let me tell you something. God wants to use the church. Did you know that? That's right. Have you read about Abraham? Mm -hmm. That it said that, 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 that through Abraham, all of the nations of the earth would be yes. blessed. And the Christian church is to be of the seed of Amen. Abraham. And as a result of this, that through the Christian church, God wants to bless the world. Amen. We're to be channels of blessings, mediums of blessings. And if the world's in trouble, the problems of the world lie at the door of the church. Amen. God wants to use you to fix the world. Did you know that? The men of the United Nations, they can't fix the world. That's right. Men in the White House, they, they're struggling in vain to try to fix the world's problems. And the only ones that have a solution are people called the remnant church of Seventh Adventists. And you and I don't understand that message. Mm. God should be able to drop every Seventh day Adventist out at the midst of a problem. And just as Joseph solved the problems of Egypt, every Seventh day Adventist should be able to solve the problem of the world. That's right. But my friends, you can never do that unless we become a lie. Unless we understand the work that God is doing, and let me tell you a secret, 
We can never fix the world until we know what messed the world up. Is that right? You agree the world's messed up, did you not? My question is, how did the world get into the condition it's in today? Sin. Go to the book of Psalms. Psalms. What did I say? Psalms. In Psalms 9, we're studying the Bible. We want to see from the Bible what caused the world to get into the condition that it's in today. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you don't understand the cause, you can never bring the solution. And so the cause must be understood so that we can affect a solution. In Psalms 9, notice what the Bible says. In Psalms 9, we're answering the question, what happened to the world? What put into the condition that it's in today? The Bible says in Psalms 9, beginning verse 15. Are you there, amen? amen. Let's read together Psalms 9, verse 15. The Bible says the, what's the next word? Heathen. Heathen. And you know what a heathen is? What is a heathen? <coughs> the heathen is the man that's without God. Jesus spoke of them as the Gentiles. Jesus said that the heathen or the Gentiles, they don't have a father to care for them, but you do. And so we can seek for our father. My friends, the heathen is the man who is without God, and the world that's without God, the Bible calls them heathen. Now notice what it says. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that... They that who made? They made. That they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. Question, who caused the problem for the heathen? Who caused the problem for the world? Yeah. The world caused its own problem, isn't that right? And if the world, by following its principles, mess itself up, do you think the world can get itself out of the problems it's put itself in? No. The world has put itself in the problems and it cannot get itself out. In fact, the Bible says in verse 16, The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the what? In the work of his own hands. And let me tell you something. As long as the church applies the principles of the world, the church is going to be messed up just like the world is. So when the church resorts to worldly education, what's going to happen to the church? Well, it's messed up. When the church reverts to worldly music and worldly dress and worldly entertainment, the same problems that are in the world pour into the church. Yes, Lord. My friends, you and I think today Satan has made us believe through propaganda, through the television, and through what's going on around us, that, that the more we imbibe of the world, the better the church is. We bring some clowns into our church. That's right. We bring some worldly rappers into our church. That's right. We bring some of these things that our church will be alive, but the moment it happens, it's dead, my friends. God is looking for someone to arouse the church. And to tell us that the reason why we're in the problem we're in is because we're following the principles of this world. Right. The only thing that man can do today is turn to heaven. Right. You see, only the principles of heaven can help us today. Amen. The Bible says, what, the, what did the world do? What happened to the world? It, 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 it messed itself up. It's because of its own hands. What is the prime cause? Verse 17. Let's read together. The Bible says, the wicked shall be turned, where? Into hell. And how much of the nation? All. What's another name for all the nations? The world. And all the nations that what? Forget God. Forget God. Now today we say we're one nation. It used to be said we're one nation under God. It can't be said today. And we can say we're under debt, but not under God. That's right. You see, my friends, the Bible is telling us that the greatest problem today is that the world has been made to forget God. That's right. That's right. You can just look at our entertainment. Yes, you Lord. can look at what passes our time. And everything that we do today is something that forgets God in it. And the longer we forget God, the more we forget God, the greater problems we have. Now, my question is, what made the nations forget God? When, the, when, when, God, when the world came from God's hand, All right. did they know God? Did the world know God? Mm -hmm. Yes. Genesis 1. The Bible said God created this world. God made Adam and Eve and made them in his own what? Image. Image. Did they know God? Yes. What happened to the world to bring it into a condition where they did not know God? As you follow down through, the Bible tells us, in the book of Revelation, what did I say? Revelation. The book of Revelation, I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 51. We'll come back to Revelation. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 51, notice what the Bible says. It's part of that threefold message. It said that Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. Why? Because she made how much? All nations do what? Drink of the wine of the wrath of God. What has happened to the nations to make them forget God? He's drunk of the wine of Babylon. You go back to it. You read back and what happened to, 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 to Lot's family when, when they made Lot drunk, he forgot who even his children were. 
The nature of wine is to so deaden the sensibilities of the mind that it doesn't know anything anymore. And what the nations, what happens in the nations is that the nations were drunk of the wine of Babylon and so the world's problems lies at the doors of Babylon's wine. And my brothers and my sisters, you think about it. When a man is drunk, can he walk straight? What happens to a man's finances when he's drunk? Can he manage his money? What happens to a man's marriage when he's drunk? What happens to his relationship of husband and wife? It falls apart. What happens to the raising of his children when a man is drunk? It messes up. What happens to everything he does when a man is drunk? He can't walk straight. He can't talk straight. He can't live straight. And the only answer to that man is to take away the wine and to make him sober. Amen. There's only one message that can make him sober. You know what that message is? The three angels message of Revelation 14. The first which talks about the hour of God's judgment that reminds us of the fact of who God is and, and tells us very vividly that, that when we understand and examine every detail of our life that we cannot do anything that would take us away from Jesus. Right. And my brothers and my sisters, the Bible has told us that this wine that has made us drunk, if we are going to fix the world, we must fix the world from drinking into Babylon's wine. Can we stop them from drinking the wine? Can we stop the world from drinking the wine? No. You say no. Well, then how is the seven evidence going to do its work? The only hope. You see, remember now, you see we're studying line by line. Follow the point. Right. What messed the world up? The world. The world messed itself up. What made the world in the position where it messed itself up and forgot God? How did it do this? The wine of Babylon made it forget God. Right. And so if the wine of Babylon is the problem, we must come up with a program to keep the world from drinking in the wine of Babylon. Babylon. My question is, how are we going to do it? You say we can't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, then our work is done. We, can't, we have no hope in this world. Mm -hmm. How is it going to happen? Jeremiah, look at what it says. Jeremiah chapter 51, there's only one answer to this. Jeremiah chapter 51. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. In Jeremiah 51, it was true in the Old Testament and equally true in the New Testament. Jeremiah 51, beginning in verse 6, the only answer is to get people out of Babylon. Right. If a man is getting drunk in a, in, in, in a club, you know what you need to do to that man? Get him out of the club. Amen. And if a man's getting drunk in his home because he has a bar in his home, get the bar and the bottle out of his home. Yeah. Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 51, look at what it says. Beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, this is the only answer. In verse 6, the Bible says, flee out of the midst of Babylon, and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her what? Recompense. Verse 7 says, Babylon have been a golden cup in whose hand? In the Lord's hand. That made how much of the earth? All the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore the nations are what? The, when it says mad, mother says not just angry, the nations are insane. That's right. They can't think straight. That's right. I mean, you think of it, how in one moment, in less than 20 days, mm. just on with, with Facebook and Twitter, a whole uh, a little city was overthrown in Egypt. Mm -hmm. All right. You think of how the protests swept over into Libya and all the rest, and now and today we're seeing this unravel. It's like our society is like a man's cheap suit. All right. You better be careful how you put it. Good. You know what happens? You start pulling that cheap suit, it starts unraveling. Right. And the nations are unraveling as they're being pulled yeah. and tugged and pushed. Yeah. And the Bible is clear that this is exactly what is taking place today. And the only hope is to get people out because as long as the nation has been inflamed and intoxicated by the wine, they can't think straight. That's right. That's right. The Bible says that it has made the nations mad. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Verse 8 says Babylon is suddenly falling. Does the New Testament tell us what to do? What does it say? Go to Revelation 18. What book did I say? Revelation. Revelation 18. What does the Bible say to do? First, Babylon, the Bible says in the second angel's message that Babylon is fallen because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. But what is the antidote? How to keep people out of Babylon? Revelation 18 tells us. This is the chapter on the loud cry. This is what we've been studying. This is the closing work of the church. Revelation 18, beginning. And verses 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. You know it. The whole earth is lighting with the glory of God. Hear those jets of light. 
verse 2 says, Revelation 18, verse 2. It says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of what? Devils. Of devils. <coughs> and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Verse 3 says, for how much of the world? For all nations, what's the problem? Have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth, that's the political leaders, that's right. have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth, these are the rich men of the earth, and the rich men of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Oh, my friends, you better understand what's going on with that. The political leaders, the religious leaders, the economic leaders that are all getting ready to unite in a so-called new deal. They're trying to fix the problems of the world. They think they're going to fix it, and the whole thing is going to collapse on them. That's right. That's where we are. Do you believe that Babylon is falling? Yes. What about her marriages? What's happened to her marriage plans? They've fallen. Mm -hmm. What about her economic plans? Oh. Somebody said, well, well, don't you think we need to listen to Dave Ramsey's? <laughs> yes. Somebody says, what about crown peace? The moment that you drink on that, you're sipping. Amen. You're sipping on the wine. Now, my friends, if Babylon's economy is getting ready to fall, how do you think that if you listen to what Babylon says, it's going to keep you up? You see, the only thing to do if a building is coming down is to get out of the building, my friends. Yes, yes, amen. You know, in 9-11, when that building was going down, the, 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 the plane, I mean, they said that the bombs were exploding and the, and the planes being, uh, the building began to start going down. The people weren't trying to go up that building. You know they're down? Yeah, they're down. They were trying to get down. That's right. Why would we be going up the world in this corporate system, trying to get higher and higher to get a name and to get a paycheck, and that building is going down? All right. Now, I tell you, there were some people that went in, but there was only one reason why they went in. Those firemen that went in were going in to take people out. My friends, if you're going into corporate America, you better know that God sent you. That's and you right. better know that the only reason you're there is because God is sending you in there to get some people out. That's right. My friends, don't you think that you can sit down in one of those nice chairs with it polished and put your foot up and think that's where you <coughs> finally arrived, you might find yourself in a pile of rubble Preach. when you could have been saved. Amen. The Bible says the only hope is to come out. What is the essence of the loud cry? What is the essence? When it says that Babylon has fallen, what is the essence of the message? What is the essence of the message? Remember now, this is the closing work of the church. Amen. We're going to tell the world that Babylon is falling, that the problem is why. We're going to explain that the teachings of the church has corrupted the world and that the world is in trouble and the only hope is Amen. to get rid of it. And, and we're going to tell them something. What are we going to tell them? Jesus. Look what it says. Revelation 18. I heard you say it. In verse 4, this is the essence of the message. It says, and I heard another voice from heaven. Now, my friends, remember now, we're talking about taking those messages and seeing them demonstrated in daily life. We're getting ready to take that principle and make it an application. Yeah. <clears throat> now, this says, in verse 4, it says, come out of her pool. Now, this is very important that we say that. The people were not God's people only after they came out. <laughs> the, they were God's people even when they were in Babylon. Now, the church was of the devil. Right. Habitations of devils, but the people, many of them belong to God. Amen. Amen. You know, my friends, today, as I say anytime I go somewhere, that today, do you know that the majority of true Christians are not in the Seventh Adventist Church? Oh, yeah. They're in Babylon. Amen. They're in the world. And the only hope is to get them out. They love God, but they have not been shown the truth for this time. And when they hear it, they're going to come flooding out. While many of the greatest Christians are in those churches, some of the greatest devils are in the Southern Adventist Church. Amen. Only waiting just a little bit longer to be shaken out. Right. Let me tell you something. You can have goats inside of the remnant church. Yes. And you can have sheep in Babylon. That's and you right. know how you know the difference? Because a goat has horns on his head. You know what he does with those horns? He butts with them. Let me tell you something. The way I know when I come into a church, who is a sheep and who is a goat is not because of their profession. Mm, that's right. It's when God tells us something. Whether it's on diet or dressing, God right, says, right. I want you to dress this way. Yeah. The goat says, but. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I know that God said, don't spend one penny for it, but I know that's Ooh. a goat. That's right. oh, boy. Sheep don't have horns right. like that. That's right. Somebody says, I, I know that God said that, that there are certain styles of music that should be in the church, mm. but. That's 
Right. I know that's a goal. That's right. That's right. I, whenever you find someone in the church that can read plain statements right. from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and say, but, he's a goal getting ready to be shaken up. That's right. And the only hope, if you that's find right. yourself a but, I used to be a but. We all be. Praise that's right. God. That's right. But I'm thankful that God can take it, but. Amen. And can create a new heart. That's right. Amen. 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 Praise him. All we have to do is ask but the essence of that message is come out of her, my people. Is that right? Come out of who? Come out of what? Out of Babylon. That's the way to keep us from the world. Come out of Babylon. Is that right? Yes. Now I want to ask you a question. If people come out of Babylon, where are we going to bring them? To Jesus. Or are we going to leave them? Are we going to bring them anywhere? Does Jesus say? John 10, Jesus said, other sheep I have, they are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. So we're going to call them out of Babylon, John 10, 16, 17, and we're going to bring them somewhere. Is that right? So if we're going to call these sheep out, we're going to bring them somewhere. Question, where are we going to bring them? You know, you know I have a question. You know I'm going to actually give me a Bible text. You know that, don't you? If we're going to bring some people somewhere, we have to have a Bible text. Is that right? In Joel chapter 2. What did I say? Joel. Joel chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. We're calling them out of Babylon. We're bringing them somewhere. Joel chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. Old Testament. Daniel, Hosea. You know what's that Hosea. Notice what the Bible says in Joel chapter 2. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. Amen. Joel chapter 2. Oh, my friends, you can never be used of God to bring people out unless you know where you're going to take them. Joel chapter 2. Notice what it says very clearly in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Notice what it says in Joel chapter 2. You're there, amen? amen? Beginning in verses 32. Beginning in verses 32. Notice what the Bible says in Joel chapter thir uh, 2, verse 32. The Bible says, And it shall, shall come to pass that, that whoever shall call on who? Name of the on Lord. the name of the Lord shall be what? <coughs> delivered. Shall be delivered. For, what's the next word? Mm -hmm. In Mount Zion, and where? In Jerusalem, shall be, shall be delivered. So if we're going to bring people out and deliver them, we're going to bring them out of Babylon, and we're going to bring them into somewhere. Where are we going to bring them in, according to the Bible? Jerusalem. It says we're going to bring them in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said. And what's the next word? And in the remnant whom the Lord future shall come. Do we know of any remnant in the last days? And the dragon is wrong for that remnant and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So if we bring people out of Babylon, we're going to bring them into the, into the remnant. Now I want to ask you a question. If the remnant is no different from Babylon, why call them out? I mean, you think of it. We had a winter time that just passed by. We see the buds now we forget about the winter just passed. One of the coldest on records and there were men that were underneath bridges trying to huddle up for warmth. And if you had been a missionary, you went under there, and you said, I want to bring that man out of the cold, my friend, you better bring him somewhere warmer than where he is. That's right. You better not bring him to another cold church. You better not bring him to another dead church. I'm telling you, friends, if you don't have a warm house to bring him in, leave him where he is. And today, multitudes are going out, and they are running to bring people out of the falling churches and in the world. And when they bring them into the remnant, they say, why did you do that? I was better where I was. It's worse in here than it was out there. You know, it came that way in the Jewish church. Did you know that? My friends, listen to me. Look at what this says. Look what the prophet says. We better make sure that you see, in order for God to do something in bringing people in, there must be something that happens to the church before they're brought in. That's right. Look at what it says. Let's read it. Volume 6, 3, 7. It says, the Lord does not win. Yeah. Now, it doesn't say he never will. But it says, the Lord does not. Now. now, that's time frame. Work. We're talking about the work of God. Does not now work to bring. Remember now, men I shall bring. Does not work to bring many souls into what? The truth. Now, when you read the Spirit of Prophecy, you better read it just like you read the Bible, very carefully. And you let every word has its place. Now, does it say he doesn't bring any in? No. It doesn't say any. It says he doesn't bring many. many. Be clear on that. It says, 
He does not now work to bring many. I want to ask you a question. Is he soon going to work to bring many in? Yes. What do we call it? The loud cry. Do you know the great controversy says that with our faces lighted up, that we're going to go from house to house, from village to village, from place to place, and to remote places, thousands upon thousands will hear words such as they've never heard before. They're going to hear that the church is babbling, falling because of the rejection of the heaven sent message that God has given. And they're going to hear not smooth things, this reason says. They're going to hear cutting truths and are going to be excited to hear. Amen. Amen. Thousands, millions coming out from the fallen churches and from the world into the remnant church, but not now. I wonder why. Two reasons. Number one, God is not now working to bring many souls into the truth because of number one, the church members. The what? And that almost doesn't even make sense. Because of the church, you would think that the members of the church are actually what's going to be bringing people into the church. Is that right? But it says God will not now work to bring many into the church because of church members. I wonder what's wrong with the church members. Who have never been converted? I want to ask you a question. Is it possible to be a Seventh-day Adventist in the church and never have been converted? Yes. I wonder if there can be any of us here today. Can you imagine that if a member is in the church, old or young, that has never been converted, and somebody says, oh, I was born into the Seventh-day Adventist church. No, you weren't. You can't be born into the Seventh-day Adventist church. You may have been born into a family that went to church on the Sabbath and to a Seventh-day Adventist family, but my friends, to become a Seventh-day Adventist, you have to make a decision. And there are many children that have been born into Seventh-day Adventist families that have never become Seventh-day Adventists because parents haven't worked with their children. And so they're, they, they don't want to come in because they see the problems that are in the home and in the church. They say, what do I need to be in here for? I'm not going in there. I didn't do anything for you. Can you imagine the hypocrisy our children see all the time? We, we play around, we, we get the church, and then we make it like everything's all right in our homes. And we say, oh, everything is good. Shake hands and make it like it's all right. And the children are looking, that's not mommy and daddy. <laughs> They're acting sanctimonious, open their Bibles at the church, but don't even have morning, even devotion every day. And I get home, ready. And we're going to bring a church, a world into the church and think that God is going to do that. Now listen. Because the church members who have never been converted, if we've never been converted, I say the only thing we need is to come to Jesus today and say, Lord, help me. Can Jesus convert a man? Yes. Doesn't matter how terrible that man's been. Doesn't matter how messed up that man's been. Even today, if you've been unconverted, you can say, Lord, here am I. Please help me, Lord. But not only members that have never been converted, number two, it says, those who are what? were once converted, but who have <coughs> Is it possible to be converted as a seven Adventist yesterday, but be unconverted today? Yes. Let me tell you something. Any time you can think back and say, I remember when I was more serious about God. You've been, you backslide. When you say, when I first came into church, I was on fire, I was zealous, but now I'm more settled. No, no, you're not settled, you backslide. That's what you did. The moment that we make a commitment in our mind, you know, sometimes the new year starts and the new civil year, and we say, we say, Lord, the new civil year is starting, I want to do something different today. I want to have more time and devotion with God. I want to be more faithful, and we start off good. And all of a sudden, we start going back on those promises that we make to God. We start compromising on the time we spend with Him, and as a result, we lose the condition that God has given us, and now, though we have once been converted, we had a name that we're living, but we died because we did not continue to keep up the experience that keeps us alive. Now, my friends, if God were to bring people into the church under those conditions, those who have never been converted, and those majority have once been converted were backslidden, what would happen to the person that came into the church? I'm going to tell you what happened. I remember it wasn't here, it was in a place far from here, so I'll tell you, we were doing the evangelistic meeting, and before we do an evangelistic meeting for the church, we tell them very clearly that there's a work of revival and reformation we must study and we must prepare for first. We went into this one church and we was going through and I was sharing the message with the people and I said, listen, we're getting ready to go through an evangelistic meeting 
and we're going to see souls brought to the church. And I say, you know what's going to be one of the greatest problems? When members come in, this exactly happens all the time. I see those in the world that have never heard of the name of God. I see those who have been gangsters. I see those that have been whirlings. I can see those who have seen that they had all the material possessions, those that are in religious churches and the rest. And I've seen that when they've been in these churches and have heard the message, I've seen them come running out to this message. Man. I remember being in, in, in one country, and I remember that a particular group, they had never even heard of Seven Adventists, started coming out to the meetings that we were holding. They came to every night. They heard the, the, the message on hell. They got rid of every piece of flesh in their, in their refrigerators and threw it out because they saw it from the Bible. We proved it from the Bible. We went through. Every subject, they were there. And finally, when we got to the end, I, I said, maybe they're seven and trying to have revival. They said, we, no, we, seven and no, we, we, we just heard about the Sabbath a couple of days ago. The father of one of the members was the leader of one of the largest churches there. And they said, we're teaching him about the Sabbath. And they said, and what we're learning, every night they were taking notes. I mean, they had books. And they went, they said, we're going to teach our father, and we're going to teach the church what we've been learning every night. And people have been running out, and then when they come into the church, you know what normally happens? They come, and we invite them over for dinner, and they see what you're eating at your table. <laughs> and they said, wait a minute, I heard in the evangelistic meeting that, 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 that churches and chicken have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. They said, I heard it. I know that that, 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 that that was not of God. And I came into the church and they invited me over. And they had the chicken wing on my plate. I mean, think of it. What would happen to the member of the church? We bring them out and we tell them that God's church is clean and trim and nice. And that, that, that they don't wear makeup and artificial adornment. And we bring them into the church. And you should see, when people never hear this and they hear from the Bible themselves, they say, I never saw it in the Bible. It's wonderful. And they start washing their face off of that field. And let me tell you, if you knew where it came from, you were washed off today. Yeah. That's another subject. Now, as they came in, they would see it. And as they come, they get excited. And 